my appreciative inquiry question is, what's the simplest thing I can do to have the maximum benefit to humanity? And that's been a very interesting question to ask yourself when you wake up in the morning. And uh, it's uh, kind of given me some motivation when things were less than clear. And uh, I started exploring uh, what worked and started getting some fairly disturbing feedback on the net effects. And that woman in India, you know, we spent $2.3 trillion helping people like her, and there was no visible sign of that money in her, her world. And I started tracking it even more so, and it seemed like there were some really heavy-duty problems between the in intent of the donors and the intent of the helpers and the net effects. So I took a year at Stanford as a fellow uh, with the Digital Visions program and started this idea of having a social network. Um, and um, I don't think any of the original people that worked on it are here. Uh, Jane looked at it a little bit. And uh, that turned out to be an uh, interesting project. And that was actually called the Uplift Academy. That's what started it as a prototype. And we looked at the role of social networks uh, Complementary currency, we had a, a thing called thank yous. You could pass thank yous around. Uh, we were going to give people positive points by giving them ahas, a little light bulb, so I could give Frankie a light bulb and she'd have light bulbs after her name for me or whatever. And the, uh, the entrance to the group was through a referral network. So somebody says you're an interesting person to bring into the group or anything, and they invest their social capital saying, uh, Susan is a, is, a, is a good person to contribute. If Susan is not a good community member, then the referrer has some negative reputation to deal with, saying, well, I recommended Susan and she didn't work out, or Joe, or whatever. So that was part of the social referral network as a, as a self-organizing principle. Um, and uh, so that, um, that's what I started with uh, on that. Um, that. That is a long story in itself. But um, so what I've been doing is, is holding these workshops. We've had them at Santa Fe Institute with Murray Gelman on uh, complexity theory and complexity and philanthropy. His, his words are on the, uh, the website. It's originally called Giving Space. And I s discovered that everybody wanted to talk about money and check writing for philanthropy instead of doing the, the deeds of the good stuff. So uh, Uplift Academy, I, 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 that really was my revelation at this, my Stanford year, was to look at patterns of uplift rather than sending money. And uh, sometimes you need to send money. Sometimes money is involved. Uh, check writing can be very uplifting. But it's not the way you start. And the whole idea of, of philanthropy as an exercise in fundraising and check writing, I think it's the, the thing backwards. So I started looking at uh, what's working, and, and the, uh, I'm, I'm calling it the transformational sector. Uh, Dick, you've got, you mentioned, somebody mentioned three sectors here. And to me, I kind of divide things into transactions and transformations. And a transaction is when you use your credit card and you put in your PIN and you get money back. And at the end of the month, your, your balance is equal to the sum of the transactions plus your beginning balance, and there's no ambiguity very crisp. We do that really well. You can go all over the world, use your ATM card, and get money out. So this, this crisp, measurable, predefined entity called a transaction, uh, it works very well for transactional activities. When you're talking about something such as healthcare, and you get a tonsillectomy, a lobotomy, and a shot of penicillin, have you had 100% of your healthcare for the month? Uh, no, you can't add up all the procedures all the transactions and say you're complete. In fact, maybe you don't want those transactions. Preventing those transactions in the first place might value it. So when there's this sense of an outside-in transformation of things that take a long time that aren't necessarily predefinable, uh, that are not uh, consistent across um, many um, uh, people, people react differently to things, the, the, the transformations are different than transactions. But we don't have a transformational accounting system, if you will, to take care of it. We don't understand the transformational process the way we understand our bank accounts uh, transactions. And that, to me, is one of the unifying themes that I've come across, is that we just don't know how to talk and measure and understand the long-term effects of what we're doing. So that's one of the 
areas that I've been very interested in. David Ellerman, who uh, uh, did a study of, he's, he, he's a mathematician, but he said he's the first person to actually do a mathematical analysis of the accounting system, which is 500 years old. And accountants don't do mathematics, mathematicians don't do accounting, but there's an incredible number of assumptions that were built into our accounting system from 1494, and we're still using them. So anyway, this notion of transformation rather than transactions. And then there's this, the, the general notion of doing good. Uh, just explicitly having the intention of, of having a, a good outcome. So having good intentions and having good effects are not necessarily one-to-one -one relationship. And uh, again, William Easterly on White Man's Burden talks about the 2.3 trillion in, in aid and development money or efforts uh, with very little, if, if not negative, things to show for it. Um, but the, the notion is that we've We've had a lot of efforts to do good in the world uh, with perverse effects. So we've had a war in poverty, we have war in drugs, we have war in terrorism. Medicine could be viewed as today as a, a war on disease or, or war on death. But uh, this, this whole mentality of trying to push uh, against our problems, uh, I think, and then using the accounting system to measure the, the history. So. Um, what I've been doing is holding these workshops, and one of the first workshops we had, a guy made a, a quip, uh, he says, we have to be on guard for premature articulation, and uh, he said that, that saying what you're saying is, or saying what you're going to do too early without knowing what you're doing is uh, there, so I'm, I'm trying to be uh, free of that problem. Um, by the way, my therapy for uh, premature articulation is to hold your tongue. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so the, 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 this workshop title is, is part of a series. Uh, last November we had one uh, called Networks of Uplift. David Reed was one of the key speakers. We didn't capture it on video, which is unfortunate, but David was one of the uh, uh, in early inventors of the Internet and talked about the, the role that the Internet played, and he has a he has, other people have named a thing called Reed's Law of Group Forming Networks, that when you start clumping together groups and putting together, there's a disproportionately growing value of, of the connectivity. It's also had some very interesting comments about the value of networks and the potential to connect. So just putting in a network uh, that allows people to, to connect with others, such as the uh, Grameen phone service in third world, uh, uh, Having a telephone number gives people great value whether or not they actually use that telephone. But uh, Hernando de Soto talked about having people having an address, just I live at 123 Main Street in this well, Main Street. But uh, so just having that potential to connect is of, of great value, and uh, which is uh, 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 very interesting. He also talked about network abundance, that, uh, that you start connecting people and you have an abundance problem, not a shortage problem. We have, I have 18 million friends on ORCID right now, and uh, so I can introduce you if you want. But um, so it's not a shortage of friends. I don't have a shortage of email. I don't have a shortage of bits to read. In fact, I have the opposite problem. I have a short of, shortage of meaning. I have a shortage of, of valuable uh, uh, signal uh, in contrast to all the noise that we have. So we've gone from this shortage of problems that you can't get to the library because you're 10 miles away and you have a horse-drawn cart to you got too much stuff. Um, that, that's that's a, a huge, huge shift. And as we go further into this, um, I started thinking about abundance. Now David also has talked about with FCC. Bob Frankston isn't here. Did any? Is that a painting on the way? I guess okay. Well, Bob was uh, a colleague of David Reed. But, um, he talks about the FCC, uh, David's involved in that, and called viral architectures on um, uh, wireless. So this wireless network we have here, we could start putting wireless things in here, and the more repeaters we have, the more capacity we have. So the more people who join the network, the more, more stuff that can flow over it. So instead of a shortage of tubes and dump trucks, if you've heard of, uh, <laughs> um, we have an abundance. And instead of 89.5 being KPBS for all of Southern California, you could have a little transmitter and talk to KPBS on here, and it, through microcells, 
talk all over the place. So the FCC is creating shortage in our communications bandwidth. Okay, so the amount of bandwidth we have on, on the Wi-Fi is just the tiniest little sliver of what else is there. So we have the fire department over here, can't talk to the police department because they have different frequency allocations and uh, they can't talk to the emergency services. Well, they can't talk because we're using this outdated model of scarcity on the communications spectrum. So if they had uh, the equivalent of a Wi-Fi, a, a digital network, there would be an abundance of communications capacity. Well. The telcos don't want that. They want to charge you $149 a month for the access on their thing. So what's happened here is we have an industry defining scarcity. Uh, then we have to develop our model of abundance within that scarcity. Healthcare has 1.2 million terms for how to be sick, UMLS, and doctors could talk till they're blue in the face about illness and disease. They can't talk about health and resilience and adaptability and coping with what you have according to their disease model. So the healthcare industry, which is, I don't know, 16 percent of the GDP now and climbing a lot of it, is based on this model of scarcity. We don't have enough health care and, and you, uh, you people need to see your doctors. Uh, so th this, this ontology or taxonomy of scarcity is part of the, the problem that I see is we start with the scarcity and then somehow you have to deal within it. So the world has already kind of been framed for us as a model of scar scarcity and I think I heard many of you talk about the kind of the box that you feel in and the sense of reframing where you are asking new questions, new language, language of abundance. So I, um, I, I think this is another really powerful issue of, of how do we get to this abundance? How do we define the abundance? And it might seem kind of wishy-washy or, or um, um, Pollyannish to talk about abundance when people are dying and starving and things like that. But in reality, we've systematically created the scarcity in so many ways that we, we can't get back to the abundance without reframing things. So Frankie is, uh, uh, turns out to be a very eloquent writer and speaker on this topic, and that's what really attracted me to hear. Some of your writing, there's one of the things that attracted me. But so this this flip from the scarcity to abundance, and in the philanthropy world, uh, the Copenhagen Consensus, they had a, a, a exercise, and they brought in economists of all people to solve the world's problems. If you had 50 billion dollars, and what are the problems, and how would you solve them? So they had you know these parade of experts. I call it a beauty contest for problems. So. You have these advocates for problems getting up, parading their problems, saying, me, 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 my problem is worse. So is AIDS worse than education, worse than poverty? Well, maybe they're kind of all the same. And maybe there's an underlying theme that connects all these things, for example, trust, that doesn't appear as a causal factor in uh, each one of those problems, but in reality is a, is a major driver for all 10 of these uh, problems. So this paradigm of we have too many problems and not enough money, and so that way we can only focus on the worst problems that or most costly problems, is actually driving this perverse incentive to say, oh, this is really a bad problem, you know, spend money here. So systematically looking at the opposite of that is what's working, are there things that we can look at? What if we could do trust raising? What if we could raise the level of trust in the world by 3%? I don't know how you measure trust, but what would that do to the world? I and mean, what would it do for commerce? What would it do for, for government? What would it do for food supplies? Uh, we don't even know how to even talk about that because we have this, this, this war on problem mentality. So this is what I've been calling the problem industrial complex that I see, uh, that you have uh, an industry around a, 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 a problem, faced around a problem, saying we're gonna fix this problem, but the growth metrics are come from it getting worse. And if we talked to David Ellerman about the World Bank. He'll, he could say very eloquently about the World Bank's problem-solving model of escalating countries from here to here to here. And um, they go from one department to another department to another department. So they pass, pass off between departments as they, as they develop and move into Class A countries or whatever. And he said, none of the countries seem, ever seem to have graduated. <laughs> they get, get stuck because this is their department's business is to run that thing. So anyway, um, and I, I don't want to criticize the, the, the people in these things. The healthcare field is full of people who want to heal. 
it, it's not a personal thing, but it's a systemic uh, orientation that uh, that doesn't know how to recognize, you know, the good stuff. Okay, so now you come along with the Uplift Academy, and we want to act on good intentions. That, that you want to heal, you want to educate, you want to help, you want to relieve suffering. Uh, there's lots of religious traditions that 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 deal with this, and I, I I'm very happy that people have those traditions, but I, I want to talk about something a level above uh, one specific religion. Uh, are there positive core values to humanity that we can amplify uh, that don't depend on uh, a, a, an underlying belief system that might be actually intimidating to those that don't have that belief system? Uh, this comes, uh, our, the positive core, core values comes out of my work with Appreciative Inquiry, David Cooper writer. Uh, a wonderful uh, model for organizational development, asking the positive uh, question that seeks to, if you answer it, you're, you're uh, moving in that direction. So as this relates to the, and also positive psychology, Martin Seligman and uh, Jonathan Haidt has been a, a wonderful teacher to me at the University of Virginia. And, uh, he's, he got his PhD in disgust, and that was his PhD in how people feel when they drink cockroach juice, or think they watch somebody drinking cockroach juice, and uh, incest also. And uh, so then he met Martin Seligman. So, well, what's the flip of that? Are there positive emotions that you could study? And disgust turns out to have this thing in your stomach, you know, your, your facial expression in your, your stomach. So he said, well, what about the emotion of elevation? The, that's a warm feeling you feel, most often triggered by witnessing or participating in an act of generosity. And it turns out it happens in the heart. You have this warm sensation in the chest. They studied it nursing women in oxytocin release, the, the breast milk of the women watching a Mother Teresa video instead of America's home video thing, release more oxytocin, which is the hug drug and all interesting stuff. I think if we just did saturation bombing of oxytocin in the world, we'd probably have a uh, solution to our things. <laughs> but um, so it, it was a systematic flip from the negative emotions to the to the positive things. And so I found that very, very powerful. Um, my mother passed away last year and uh, had congestive heart failure. So it was a, a fairly long um, plan process. And um, so I had a lot of time to talk to her and uh, deal with things. I asked myself the question, how can I make her last moments as joyful and as peaceful as possible? And it completely shifted the experience from son of a dying mother to an, uh, a participant in this process. And um, I'll talk about the results of it, but it was a life-changing uh, thing. She, it was a, an amazing last moments with her and uh, it completely shifted the experience to something that transformed my whole family and uh, very positive. So I, I took this tragic situation and turned it into a positive transformation. The workshop title here is Patterns of uh, um, uh, Creating Patterns of Infectious Good. And I'll, I'll kind of break that down and uh, uh, talk about what we're looking at. And, this is a very difficult thing to do without an eight-hour lecture. But patterns is a way of looking at what's working as the activity itself rather than the organization doing the activity. So today we have 1.4 million nonprofits in the United States. All of these are organized as, I'm sorry? Social benefits. Well, they're, okay. <laughs> I use third world too. but. Um, but anyway, they're all organized as the vertical stovepipe. They're pulling money typically from the same donor pool, they do all the stuff, and then down at the bottom goes the services, the activities that are done. To cut across that and say, well, what are the services here? What, what, do, we, what do we know that works? And how do we do more of it? From the perspective of the activity, so it's an activity-based model of uh, let's, let's collect these ideas, and then let's get smarter in doing them. So, the, the, this is the, the essence of the, the pattern model that I'm looking for. And are there patterns that we can study and then get feedback from, from the use of it? So the other re revelation that I've had here is the, the lack of feedback. And the feedback is probably more important, at least at the beginning, 
than the activities that you do. Uh, that, that figuring out how to improve what you're doing and having this, uh, this delta that, that gets better is the, the, the key trigger point here. But uh, so the idea of, is of understanding things from this template level that anybody could apply or, or could be applied across all whole industry. And then um, using this as the trigger point for communication. So we have a podcast network or a, a, a way of developing electronic communications or mailing lists or whatever around this pattern, perhaps in Swahili and uh, on video phones in the third world. I don't know. But the point is you, you, you take this pattern and you grow it as an entity into itself. And one of the things about Alexander patterns is that it, it's not a manifesto saying, I think it should be this, but it's actually, you, you point to three instances, say this one, this one, this one are working. What's the commonalities and how do you work that? So uh, Oxfam is doing uh, savings-led microfinance, PACT is doing it, Catholic Relief Service and CARE. So we have specific instances of this. Jeff will be talking about this later. And it's not a, a plug for Oxfam or PACT or whatever. It's saying, well, what's working here and how can we, uh, how can we propagate this? There's whole lots of other patterns of uplift that we can talk about. And um, uh, I don't know how many there are, and I, I, I don't want to prejudge that. Um, two other patterns that I've looked at in reading your work on uh, uh, Frankie is one is uh, urban gardening and uh, uh, Alice Waters' work on organic vegetables. I've heard this in Colombia and uh, England and Belize of teaching people to grow their own gardens. And you buy the seeds and you grow them and suddenly you're, you see what happens when your food appears in your vacant lot. And there's a whole bunch of benefits to that. And, what, what, and there, people are, are doing this. I mean, this is not a new thing, but could we turn this into another pattern? And could we uh, study this and patternize that? And, 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 propagate that within the urban gardening community. And the other one that we're looking at with Civic Ventures is for senior co-housing, that we have this whole cohort of people in the United States that are lonely. Um, why not put them together somehow? So patterns of co-housing. So these are three patterns that I've just have bubbled up in my own head uh, that I'd like to look at. And uh, specifically, we're looking at uh, um, savings led microfinance today. Uh, we have a small grant from a MIDI uh, network omidyar.net to support that. And can we, t can we end up with a, a, a two-page overview that we can then propagate, see what happens, get it out on the network and get people to use this, and then propagate this and, and get, start getting the feedback. The infectious good model is, comes from this notion, for, again, from Easterly and uh, Hirschman and quite a few other people of, finding out what's working and doing more of it. So Hirschman called it finding where virtue is afoot in the third world. So instead of having a central planned execution of something, you have this search amplify model of saying, oh, this is working over there, let's, let's do more of it. So I was talking with Gustavo Esteva in Oaxaca, uh, Mexico recently, I don't know if you know. And uh, he talked about the UN requirements for flush toilets for being a developed country. And, said the Indians around Oaxaca don't use flush toilets. The, the women go out in the morning and it's a social event in the fields. And by the way, there's no man mandate for sewage treatment. So if you do put in flush toilets, it all runs into the river and pollutes the river. So they've been living this way. He's saying, well, I want to do dry toilets and composting and things like that. And he can't do that because you're supposed to have flush toilets. So here's this plan execute of somebody in a committee saying the world needs flush toilets, and he's saying, well, why, why can't we do uh, dry toilets? So the, the search amplify model of, of finding what's working and systematically going out and finding the little things that can then be done on very large scale or whatever is appropriate scale. So we know about scale on the internet. We know how to take little things and uh, ramp them up to much larger things. And uh, so all of you self-organizing people, I'm, I'm overrunning my own timeline here. So, um, so the, the amplification model, uh, infectious good is, is there a way of finding this viral quality that, that when somebody does something, they kind of recharge the system and make it happen even more so? Uh, the same thing way as Wi-Fi networks can grow on their own. And is there a way of, of conceptualizing a way of, of finding the little things that don't necessarily cost money or if anything at all, 
but do have this viral quality, and is there a way of feeding that back through what we know about networks? Obviously, we can only reach the billion people or so on the network. There's five billion outside of it. Is there a fringe network of network animators or network weavers that, that have access to an inter, uh, uh, internet cafe that can burn a CD and take it out to a village or take their cell phone and things like that? So are, are there patterns of infectious good? I'm not saying that all things have to be done this way, but um, is, is there some mechanism that we can understand this? Uh, and it's a multidisciplinary problem. Jeff is very, very well connected in the real world on the ground and tells you about Molly and things like that. He's not a computer scientist and uh, he's not a geek. Howard's the geek. I don't know if you know the, the social third world stuff. But anyway, we, we have a lot of talent in the room here. So that part of it is a brainstorm along those themes. If we come up with, with an idea that would be fantastic, if we come up with other patterns, um, if you want to talk about something entirely different, uh, if this energy takes you elsewhere in open space, that's certainly, uh, that's what it's here for also. But I think what's going to happen is we'll have a separate follow-on meeting specifically for the nanofinance pattern uh, after, after this. So, uh, the, the, and Marsha Dell couldn't be here. I, I was going to show Marsha's and David Ellerman's talk from Paris, uh, but our, didn't have the right cables. Marsha would have said that her savings led microfinance groups, there's three universalities that make them successful. One is women in groups. Uh, another is women uh, em empowerment, that, that once women learn that they have the power to change things, it's kind of no stopping them. And the three is that they do, they do take action. So if you give them the literacy and even the tiniest financial liberation, they'll go after the uh, trafficking, the, the, all the injustice that they see. So you're not going after the injustice, you're going after the, their power to, to do it on their own. So she pounds the table and say dependency is not empowering. And that's one of, one of the things I quote a lot. But rather than building dependency on those nice people in the Land Rover that come out to visit us, build it in t at the grassroots level and build that autonomy and that, that help. David Ellerman says the same thing. He has a book called Helping People Help Themselves and the conundrum of I'm here to help you be independent. Uh, so how do, you, how do you do that? How does a teacher teach someone to learn? Uh, and he's got uh, a long theory on that. But he makes a point of we have this tradition of transactional stuff, the outside people flying in and making the change and then flying back. So we vaccinated those people but we haven't developed their indigenous healthcare system for example. Uh, so the, the notion of uh, the engineered approach to do things works in some areas, but it doesn't work in all areas. And to take the engineering approach that, that the experts know what to do and can fly in and make that village better and fly home, uh, flies in the face of the search amplify model of finding the little things. So at that, um, I also want to talk about Wikimania. Uh, Mark Frazier and I were there, learned tremendous amount of things. Uh, that's another hour discussion. But uh, what is radical about that is the role of openness. And I mean, people see it as an encyclopedia versus uh, online encyclopedia versus Encyclopedia Britannica. That's just the tip of the iceberg. The, the whole role of open systems and what that's going to do to society. There's a group called Sunshine Foundation that's doing a, a way of linking people's political reputation and funding to blogs. So we'll have increased transparency of legislation. What, 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 and this is coming from the outside. It's, it's uh, uh, where earmarks come from, kind of a, uh, a blogging approach to where this money is going. Congresspedia is called. Uh, what's this going to do to healthcare, open source publishing of courseware, things like that. Anyway, um, some really fundamental shifts that are happening of enormous magnitude with regard to openness. And um, so I probably will propose that as a, an open space topic uh, uh, today. Okay, Nava. We're going to take a break. Time to take a break and then. We'll be back at 11. Yes.